さ。うん And on that happy note, <laughs> yes, I'm Mark, and I'm Tom, and we're the Cinemaniacs. Back from a festive long weekend. Yes, how was here. yours? Well, there was no morgue involved, which was nice. <laughs> um, I think I possibly ordered my height in DVDs and Blu-rays over this weekend. <laughs> well, thanks to you, my pocketbook is about $200 lighter as well. Yeah, I can just say so. I can't. <laughs> the, the sales are so crazy. It's pretty it was, amazing. The Fox, the Fox website had season sets of TV shows for $6. Right. I mean, so it's boom, 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 buy them all. It's, it's like, I'll well, never I've never watch seen seven seasons of the Mary Tyler Moore Show. Perhaps this is the right time <laughs> in my life to do that. That's true. So uh, aside from just... Foolishly spending money that I didn't have. Uh, it was a fun to get together with the family and Good. and wear a really serious and form-fitting dent in the shape of my tuchus on the couch. <laughs> uh, got a lot of viewing done this weekend. Good. Uh, speaking of viewing, yes, we watched movies for this show this uh, week. I did at least. I did don't you know? Do but oh uh, sure, why not? But uh, yes, would you care to start? Oh sure, if I may. Okay. So uh, okay, uh, <laughs> what do you do when you are the younger sister of an older sister? who is the princess of the land and has this little problem with everything she touches turns to ice. Well, you hope that you don't get too close because you might get frozen. Not a kid's film unless some discussion of the record there's, is in there. Yeah, right, if there's some <laughs> kind of like frozen poop or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. get it. Um, and I didn't get this too much. I kind of didn't either, you know? <laughs> very, very popular at, oh, at yeah. 10 cinemas where we choose to go to see films. Uh, lines almost literally out the door when I got there to see this. And this is like what everybody was going to see who wasn't seeing Hunger, Hunger Games again. Right. Saw this weekend. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of little kids and families. Um, I just thought it was boring. Sorry. Well, you say little uh, kids, I think that's the target audience. Yeah. And we always get into this discussion of is there enough for the adults? And I didn't think this one gave it to us. No, the, 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 the main princess, I mean, the focus is on the, the, the other sister, to quote the title of a pretty bad other movie. <laughs> uh, the main sister, she has, she's, in my mind, she's like Iceman from Spider Man and his amazing friends. Everything she touches, she can create ice, which is kind of cool. Right. Uh, and, and she sort of keep, is kept away and she hides her power because she doesn't want to be thought of as a freak or a monster. And the younger sister is trying to break through, the, break the ice, break through the <laughs> ice, and, and and reconnect their relationship and all that. So this younger sister, who I believe is played by Kristen Bell, her mannerisms and speech are very contemporary, and I think that's almost a nod toward the parents in some ways. Some of the lines she delivers seems like they're thrown more toward the adults, and it's not wink, wink pop culture references. Right. It's just more seeing the world with adult eyes. Uh, but overall, it's just a very simple tale of good. Was there even evil in this movie? No, there was bad, a, some tro troubled overture. times. Whoop yeah, troubled times, and <laughs> will I find a pretty boy to kiss me, and that right. kind of thing. And it, it really felt like a movie that was for little girls to me. Uh, I, I, I was pretty. It, this is one of those movies where I was kind of okay and watching it to a point, and then it crossed a certain line in time where I just said, "I'm done." I, you could wrap this up anytime now, and it's long too. This is, I think, this is around two hours, which yeah. was. I was really waiting for it to end after a certain <laughs> point. It looks great. The animation is great. Right. I saw it in 3D, and the 3D, you notice it from time to time, which to me is a plus if you're paying extra for it. Right. Uh, the, the sound was good. It was in stereo. But other than that, this is nothing I would recommend to anybody who doesn't think it looks great because it just seems so common and standard to me. Right. And, and, it, and it's a musical. Not like there are, you know, occasionally a song, it's like a musical where right. people are and singing their thoughts and all that. You sure can't really tell that from the trailer. And no, they, don't, they actually don't tip that hat at all, tip that hand at all. And if, 
I'm not really a fan of Broadway musical song stylings, and that's what this is, Broadway or Disney musical stylings. So right. the vocal styles that you come to expect if you like that sort of thing are in here. I don't, so that kind of graded on me too. Um, so what I thought was interesting and what I love these days about animated films is that this was preceded by a short, an animated yes. short. Uh, it, was an old, it was a Mickey Mouse cartoon. <laughs> and I thought that was clever. I didn't think it was particularly funny, but I thought it was clever because if you the, see it in that cartoon itself, or that it was preceded by uh, that cartoon, this okay. little Mickey Mouse, right. and we're like Steamboat Willie Mickey Mouse, like right. classic Mickey Mouse, and they they, it's done in three D. If you see it that way, if you don't see it in three D, I think you're actually kind of missing a lot with that. But they kind of play with the convention of old versus <laughs> new, color versus black and white, and three D and the theatrical experience, right. and that was pretty fun to sit through. I wish more three D films would use the 3D that much. Because again, if you're sitting, if you're paying extra and if you're wearing what for some people are uncomfortable glasses, <laughs> you should notice that effect, you know what I mean? Well, and that's the right length of time because I, I don't want that to happen all the time during a 3D film. And you folks know perfectly well, I'm basically down on 3D. Right. Um, and half the time, as you say, we'll see a 3D film and, and then remember at the end of the film, oh, that was in 3D. And you barely noticed. Yeah, I thought the, um, uh, I thought the, the short, when they can come at you mm -hmm. a lot, really kind of helps emphasize it. So, uh, overall, yeah, I, I thought Frozen was pretty... Yeah, pretty I keep looking for... Um, it really did surprise me, the number of musical numbers, and they're well, you know, they're well performed. It, you have to, uh, you know, you have to throw away a little believability whenever musicals come right. along, because how does everybody know the lines? How does they, and they all start breaking in the song. The first couple times, it, it kind of threw me, took me aback, because I wasn't expecting that from this, because they don't advertise it as a musical, and I wasn't expecting that. Once I get into it, I enjoyed it. The, the performances are all perfectly fine. It just really is, and I expect more from uh, studios like this. It really is just for the kids. I don't think there's a lot there. It's not uh, horribly boring, uh, but there's nothing there for the adults, and I think these can. We've seen many films that do work on multi-levels. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wonder why why that didn't happen. So Frozen, you know, perfectly, you know, overall inoffensive for the kids. Nothing wrong with it. But uh, uh, as a film, I was expecting a bit more, and um, you know, wasn't too crazy about it. I agree. Speaking of films for the whole family. Oh yes, exactly. Um, I, I won't say the what are you going to do, but uh, maybe, maybe you, we do have to kind of ask that when you're stuck in the midst of Nazi Germany and the mom's deserted you and you're thrown together with this new family, you want to better yourself. You want to uh, um, learn more as much as you can and educate yourself and become more worldly, but you have no money, and so ultimately what you have to do is resort to being the book thief. So not the feel-good hit of this, of this winter. Uh, well, initially, I mean, it gets, it gets pretty grim, and it's clearly about the Holocaust and how this young girl... Peripherally uh, about the Holocaust. Yeah, we're not... Uh, we see people taken away, and, uh, and we know, you know, the adults and right. people who are familiar with it know what's going on. It really focuses on this girl. Uh, at the beginning of the film, she and her brother are being taken away um, from her mother. We don't quite know why. Uh, obviously, you find out later on why that her mother's been taken by the Nazis, and her brother. This isn't giving anything away. Her brother dies really early on, so it's just her, and she's left with this family: Jeffrey Rush and his wife. And it's obvious that they're getting paid something by the state because the mother is really pretty kind of nasty to start off with, and she says, "Oh, great! Now there's only one of them. Well, we agreed to get two stipends." Blah 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 blah. So it's really kind of set up to where Rush is a nice guy, and. Uh, he uh, pretends not to be able to read so that he can help this this young new girl read. And it's about oh, inner relationships and, and interpersonal communication with within this town and all these people who get together. For me, uh, it was beautifully shot. Performances overall I thought were really, really lovely. I think once again, this is aimed at certainly not younger kids, um, you know, like not like real young, six, seven, eight, right. but uh, older than that, teenagers, maybe even into older teens, I'm not sure, who aren't aware of really what's going on with the Holocaust and maybe kind of a, it felt like a, a watered down introduction, kind of. My comment was it's, it's a, uh, a watercolor on a franc. It's a good movie to start conversations. Yeah. Um, I didn't know anything about this going in. I saw the title on the poster. Okay, right. On the, the theater's website. So this was completely, it, it unfolded to me as a story should Everything's a surprise. Okay. Uh, so a little ways in, it says, you know, Germany, 1938. And I'm like, okay, I think I see where this is going. 
And because uh, pretty much any story that starts like that, you know how it's going to figure end. right. Uh, and the the main little girl who's the 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 lead in this was very good. Everybody She's in wonderful. this was great. The, it was very nicely shot. It had a great sense th that you were there, which maybe isn't the sense that you want. <laughs> in far of all the all the times and places you could choose to spend two right. hours, you know, Nazi Germany probably wouldn't be one of them. But uh, just the level of detail in, in the sets and the costumes and everything felt authentic to me. So it never took me out of the story that I was watching. Okay. Um, it, it doesn't get explicit, I don't right. think. It's dark. Uh, this is, and make no mistake, I'm looking at the camera for this one, this is a crying movie. Uh, so <laughs> bring Kleenex because this is, this is a, a pretty rough ride toward the end. Again, not explicitly, but it's just, it's a lot of sad stuff that happens in it. So I'm sitting there watching this movie with like four other people substantially older than I am in the theater thinking this is a more or less a kids movie film that that's aimed at kids right. and all the kids are seeing a movie about you know talking dancing right. snowmen and yeah. they probably should be seeing this movie right. because watching this it just brings up so many of these things where history does repeat itself and those who do not learn from history are doomed to uh, to relive it and I'm like, you know, these are some pretty good lessons that should be seen in this film. This is probably something that will be shown in schools, if schools still show films to kids. Um, the first time I've ever seen Kristallnacht, which is something yes. that is, I don't want to say celebrated, commemorated in Keene every year, and we, right. we ch tape and show on the station. That was shown, and I was like, oh wow, I've never seen that in a movie before. Uh, there are actually some lighter moments in this movie. It almost feels weird to laugh during this film. Right. But, and it's not stupid, wacky, hit pe people being hit on the head music uh, things, but... It's just, you know, it, it almost reminded me of Life is Beautiful in a way, Very, which is a always called a Holocaust comedy, but it's like in desperate times, people are trying to keep their spirits up on occasion, right. little games or little, little things that they do. So I really thought this was a good movie, quite a bit, actually. This is a film that may not do very well because it's up against all these big commercial right. franchise pictures, but this is something that I think people should should try to see while it's still in theaters. Right, I don't it's very immersive, so it's a, it's a nice theatrical experience. Right, I don't think, uh, particularly since you know they've all got these huge television sets anymore. I don't think this is going to lose a lot in translation when we bring it to home video. Um, it, very few people in the audience when I went to see it, uh, and I do think that's unfortunate. I hope Keen Cinemas gives us a chance to stick around because I do think this is something that, um, again, it's not. I think comedies are always great to see in. Uh, with a lot of people, and I think something like this that has such a uh, any kind of important thing to say, uh, and as you say, you know, uh, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. Uh, I think it's good that these things come out a little bit. My ultimate little, um, uh, I was I was somewhat disappointed. I knew not a lot about what the the real topic was, but I heard a lot of great things about the book and the film, and I was real happy to see that our friends at Keen Cinemas got it. Um, I appreciate that. But I just kind of thought, you talk about Kristallnacht, and we see Kristallnacht uh, occur, and then boom, we're away from it. And this is ultimately why I think I felt this was more aimed at kids, because we didn't dwell on that. Right. We didn't see the real ramifications of it, because I think it's really kind of just an introduction to some horrible things that happened, and then move on, let's, let's deal with the rest of these things, which um, I thought overall it, it did pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. I kept, one of my problems was, uh, before I went into this, like I said, I didn't know a whole lot, and we kept seeing the poster and everything like mm -hmm. that, and there was just something about the, the actress, and I think she's wonderful, but there was something about her that I just didn't, it made me uneasy, it made me edgy, and I wasn't looking forward to seeing this film. And I did a little research before, and I finally figured out what it was, and, and I mean, you can take a look and see what bothers me about it. Kind of, kind of finally figured out, you know, that's what good. it was that, that bothered me that's about good. that. So anyway, ha. there was well, that scene where the, Nazi humor, isn't that funny? Where the Nazis <laughs> took the bug and they put it in that guy's ear. Yeah, that it, was yeah, that was pretty was, troublesome oh, too. Horrendous. So anyway, uh, so anyhow, but classic. moving on. So um, overall, um, I think it was a very interesting, well, very well-made film. I'm right. hoping to see uh, at least something like for art direction, costume design. Certainly, I don't think while she's the real star, um, I don't think she has enough oomph to pull. Uh, an, an Oscar nod for Best Actress, but Rush might get one for supporting, I think, because performances overall were all real fine. So it, it did seem, 
I don't want to say Oscar bait because that seems kind of cruel. But yeah, there were elements of it that made me think this might get an award. Certainly worthy. Really well done. Right. Yeah. Uh, speaking of award-winning cinema, yes, Sean. Uh, if I may, <laughs> what do you do when you're an ex-Interpol uh, undercover cop who's changed your life and moved to a small Louisiana town to escape all the bad things and probably a biker gang who's trying to kill you? Well, you hunker down, you get ready, and you defend your home front. Oh, he's coming down he's like a. Oh, you better watch out. <laughs> uh, hey, so uh, we were just talking off air. We're, I knew nothing about this going in. I knew very little, and then um, when the opening credits came up, I knew I was in trouble. Or a, I produced I was by in... Sylvester Stallone. Oh, that's interesting. And written by Sylvester Stallone. Written by oh, Sylvester Stallone. Oh, watch out. So I did a little digging okay. of my own, a little cinematic sleuthing, and this was originally written to be a Rambo 5 <laughs> script. This I was can... written. This was one of the scripts that was being looked at as being the follow-up to the last Rambo movie. Right. And I remember at the time had, having heard that the next Rambo film might be uh, Rambo against homegrown terrorists, like okay. a militia kind of thing. So uh, apparently Statham knew of this script, knew they weren't going to make it as a Rambo movie, and asked if he could have it for a vehicle. So they rewrote it for Statham okay. and not to be the Rambo character, which is interesting to me that I think about this movie, how would it have been different if it was Rambo? Like, what did they change and what did they keep? Right. Um, so basically, I don't, I don't know, basically, <laughs> Statham is the guy who's, uh, it, it opens up, he's uh, undercover in a biker, a biker meth ring gang, and uh, they they bust these guys, and the the head of the biker meth ring's son gets killed by the law enforcement, and he's swears vengeance on Statham and his family. Right. And then you cut to Statham uh, living with his daughter in this small town, and one thing leads to another, and bad stuff goes down. <laughs> uh, James Franco plays a uh, local meth lord king who's the villain, and I generally don't like James Franco, but I thought he wasn't bad. As See, I do. I tend to like him. Southern but... fried, you know. Okay. At first, the first scene he's in in this movie, he's busting up these kids who are <laughs> cooking meth and using it with a big stick, and he's beating the hell out of everybody. I'm like, oh, this is like Walking Tall. He's going to be like <laughs> yeah, another right. Buford Pusser. And then he <laughs> flipped, and he was a bad guy. Sorry to give that away. Uh, so, oh, this was, again, at times, this was really nicely shot. Yeah. And except whenever any action happened. <laughs> Then it was just like, ah, well, let's let's just shake that camera around a lot. And people don't need to see what's happening, right? <laughs> right. And it's a it's a damn shame because you can see that Statham is doing some neat moves right. on people and the choreography they took the time to choreograph it and to hire people to do it. And then they do this with the camera <laughs> and cut it really fast and it's just like, I think he hit that guy because the guy's laying out down now. Right. It's like, why do you bother? And once I realized that was the game, I was just like, ugh. Um, it has some funny dialogue, some funny badass dialogue, and some nice moments of revenge. And at one point, Statham does something to the bad guy's lair that you know is going to pay off later. Yep. And that was pretty cool watching that. So overall, I was entertained by this. I, I think overall, the end product is probably more worthy of being straight to video than being theatrical. Right. I mean, that yeah. last um, Statham film we saw that was almost like a modern day Robin Hood. Right. Which is not the Dukes of Hazard. Uh, what was that called? Redemption or Ret I think, something I think like that. That was really good. That, to me, was yeah. more worthy of being theatrical than this was. But, uh, man, action pickings are really slim these <laughs> days. Because whenever they make them, they throw them away with this kind of stuff. So, I mean, if you like action movies and you don't mind not being able to see what's going on, it's <laughs> probably a pretty good time. And I giggled a few times during this because of yeah. the, the badassery and whatnot. Um, Winona Ryder's in this film? They're sort of, I guess. Horribly miscast. Well, and she, yeah, yeah, she was horribly miscast. Nothing really to do, and and I she mean, was just pretty lame. I could say movie. she she just was bad acting in this movie, but I'd like to say she was miscast. Instead. <laughs> That's nice. Uh, but otherwise, I it was a pleasant trip down to Louisiana with some guys getting their asses. I guess bad we, yeah, guys I, though, so that's cool. In the long run, I felt this was. Um, too much paint by numbers. I, I do like Franco anymore. Um, I just like the guy. And so yeah. he get gets to chew into this kind of a badass, just give some crazy uh, looks and everything like that. Um, I've learned to like Statham. Ever since Expendables 2, I think anybody affiliated with Expendables 2, I'll give you like 10 more movies. I like I Statham. Loved it so I just think he makes 95%, 98% bad movies. Right. And it's a shame. Right. And um, but, but as you know, and as you said, I mean, you know he's really doing that. And you can't really tell it. Um, one of the this felt so paint my numbers because in, and in, it's interesting that you mentioned because I didn't know this about the uh, that Stallone originally planned this for a Rambo right. sequel. Um, once we get we, we have that introduction where uh, Statham's breaking up that meth lab and the biker uh, and the biker ring and everything like that. Then boom, fast forward two years and they're spending all this time saying, "I'm really sorry your mom died. Oh, I missed mom so much." What that all comes out of nowhere and that. 
you know, plays a heavy, heavy toll on it. Um, we have some decent supporting characters. Kate Bosworth mm -hmm. is this uh, just seemingly just nutsy, um, super B I T C H. Uh, with this, with her rather overweight kid who picks a fight with Statham's kid, which is the on. cause of all the problems. <laughs> That's in this the movie. problem. The How whole many thing people on... died because that kid was a punk? <laughs> a lot. I love Bonesworth, and she has an interesting character arc a little bit. So I kind of like that. But ultimately, my biggest complaint with this, because you know, it's got it's the whole revenge thing. Um, it is. I did like two things about it. Um, and those were both that they held off some surprises for me. Mm -hmm. You knew the biker gang had to come back into play, but I'd almost forgotten about them by the time they do come back into play. And then you mentioned uh, Statham's ability to really ruin the drug, the drug pin, James Franco's uh, stash and everything like that. I'd almost forgotten about that by the time it comes out. So that was fun. But in the long run, um, the real bad guys, the real guys I felt super threat to Statham's character, they're hired by Frank Owen and the, the biker gang all come back. And he takes them out real quickly. And then the last half hour is like James Franco being the bad guy. And I just felt, and I think this is miscasting again. I, I can't, I know it's Franco. He's not a superstar, but I know it's Franco. And I just felt, gee, is your threat level all the way up here if he took out that biker gang? Right. So the whole last half hour, you know, filled in the pieces for me, but I felt no threat. And this just, um, this just felt like a, a real cookie cutter kind of thing to try to get, I mean, again, I'll keep equating it with uh, <laughs> with the Avengers movies. I don't know what Statham's coming out with. Right. Maybe this is for the Expendables 3. Yeah, yeah. But boy, we gotta turn this movie out because we got other things coming. Right. Not not terribly crazy about it. Well, uh, for those of you who see this film and Keen, live in Keen, uh, this is in Cinema 6. That kind of tells you a little something? Yeah, that just tells you a little something. This is, this <laughs> might, uh, I always refer to that as the short time theater. So if you're interested, I would not wait very long to see that film. Right. Uh, we thank our friends at Keen Cinemas, by the way, for providing us with uh, these films to see. And That's being true. So nice and friendly and having such sharp images and lovely sound. It always sound good. If nothing else, it's like, it sounds good. Uh, <laughs> the movie's terrible, but it's in razor sharp stereo. Uh, so, uh, but similarly, some... we thank our friends yes. over at Video Headquarters, uh, where I tend to uh, rent my, I rented, uh, actually, um, my younger sons had not, well, my sons, um, they're younger than I am, yes. as most people are around here, um, hadn't seen the game, just as a Oh, that's a fun game, yeah. Uh, and it was really, really fun. Um, Benjamin, uh, down at his college, has two or three times a year, does movie marathons, where they do like... Uh, 12 or 16 hours of movies and he's gone through all the Harry Potter's gone through all of these other things so he's uh, he liked the game so much he's gonna do a mind-blowing uh, movie <laughs> marathon so I've been making some recommendations so that was fun but um, so anyway uh, yes. moving on to I guess that was the, my transition to video headquarters um, I don't that was it I don't just let them give me free movies I do also rent from them because they have a great selection. But one of the things that uh, they had out for us, and it is coming out tomorrow, if you happen to be watching this on Monday, uh, is Academy Award nominee Hugh Jackman is back as your favorite uh, knife through his fingers wielding character. And we find a lot about the real background of the Wolverine. Hugh Jackman, star of Movie 43. And, <laughs> yeah, don't and, blame him for that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I really love this yeah. a lot. I did not like the uh, previous Wolverine, X-Men Origins right. Wolverine, which is the first Wolverine solo movie. Yeah, that was just silly. Um, so I wasn't expecting much going into this, but this is this did everything right that that last one mm -hmm. did wrong. It's not a typical superhero movie where it's just fight scene, fight scene, fight scene, and anything that's not a fight scene is just a chance for you to catch your breath until the next fight scene. <laughs> it's it's contemplative. It's, it's a lot about the, the character of Wolverine and what it's like to be somebody who's, you know, walked the earth for so long. I mean, it opens in, in World War II. Right. And it, it's him saving the life of this Japanese soldier in a prison camp that he's in where he's, I think he's about to be executed, if I recall. And then it flashes forward to the modern day where this, this soldier is now an old man who has always wanted to, you know, thank the Wolverine and all that. And then it, basically the Wolverine is, is working for this guy. It's basically a samurai movie right. or a ronin film. So this feels like a Japanese samurai film. It takes place entirely in Japan. It's got some beautiful photography. There's a set piece that's one of the more visually impressive and memorable set pieces I've seen in a long time where uh, it involves a lot of arrows, let's yes. just say, uh, toward the end of the film that was very impressive in the theater right. in 3D. And uh, boy, I really wish they would make more like this. More superhero movies and especially more Wolverine movies where they, they just take their time with it and it's, it's, 
it was a lot. There was a lot more to it. There was it had a lot more going on upstairs than a superhero movie usually does. Right. Um, the fight, the action sequences were pretty impressive for the most part. Uh, the first one suffers from really horrendous camera work and editing because they're trying <laughs> to emulate the fact that he's been drugged and he's trying to you know deal with it. I say if you want to emulate that, you shoot it and, sh and, and edit it perfectly, and occasionally you cut to a camera with some Vaseline <laughs> on the lens, and then we know that he's not doing great. Um, but uh, yeah, this was really good. Uh, apparently there's a slightly longer version of this on video, okay. uh, but I, I was talking to our friend at video headquarters and he had said that he thought it was just the 3D Blu-ray, which to me is lame because that's the smallest portion of the market right. possible who could enjoy that. Yeah. But uh, I'm curious to see, apparently the longer cut is a bit more violent, like it had to be toned down to not be an R-rated oh, film. Okay. And the uncut version is just a little bit more brutal, right. which is in keeping with the samurai movies. If you ever watch even the old well, Kurosawa and in, films, and there's a lot of... Pst, yeah, I mean, the guy's got knives out of his hands. Right. So, uh, so yeah, I, if you like Hugh Jackman, if you like X-Men, if you like Wolverine, this is absolutely one to check out pronto. I, I think similar to what we've said about uh, the, with the superhero characters, when you get the right combination of actor and, and role with Downey Jr. as both Tony Stark and Iron Man, you cannot separate them. Um, right. Uh, they're so intrinsic, and Jackman just really personifies Wolverine. Um, you don't have, uh, I mean, there's not the... Like with, with Spider-Man, with Iron Man, there's the um, secret identity bit mm -hmm. that's going on, although Tony isn't uh, a secret identity. You don't have that with Wolverine. Wolverine is Wolverine, but we what troubles him is his past. Um, X-Men Origins kind of touched on this, and you're right that this gets back to, it's a very serious portrayal. Um, Jackman does a great job of it. We know he's a wonderful actor. Um, he was terrific in Les Mis, although he doesn't sing in this one. But it, you're right, it's the way that it deals with this material. It's a long it's not a drawn out film, but it's a long film. It's a long time before we get to fight sequences. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of this film is not action fight sequences. It's these characters dealing with their inner turmoils. And I was just bowled over in the theater. I thought it was a terrific transfer on video. And uh, I mean, Wolverine, strangely enough, uh, people are going to start complaining about me talking as highly as I do about uh, Expendables 2 and Wolverine. Hey, but one of my fun. favorite films of the year. Just really well done. Really, really good. Yeah. Uh, speaking of what could be one of your favorite films of the year, if I may. If you have to. Uh, what do you do when you're a young, attractive, teenage-type female girl who suddenly discovers that you've got magical powers and there's a whole new world out there for you to discover? Well, you... Pack your bags and you boogie on down to Mortal Instruments, the City of Bones. Let's see, this reminded me of this and this and this. See, so you and got that. your Harry Potter. <laughs> you got your Twilight. Yep. You got your Star Wars. <laughs> you got everything. You got there. your every what every successful you, you got you got yeah. Uh, I, I am amused. <laughs> you know, I'm a student of exploitation and trash movies, and so I'm always amused by ripoffs and knockoffs and right. things that are trying to fool audiences and stuff. And the studios clearly, very clearly, <laughs> are desperate to find another Harry Potter or another Twilight. So they keep bringing out these films about people who discover that they're part of something bigger and they're magical right. and they have to get some. They all have to be extremely attractive and oh, around yeah. 18 to 24. Yeah, and so, <laughs> so the, basically the story is that this girl discovers that she's some special kind of breed of not quite human who can see and hunt demons. And uh, she's taken into the, into the care of this group of people who are all young and hot and have tattoos. Sorry, they're runes, but <laughs> right. it's an excuse to make them look you know, edgy because they have tattoos all over them. And they're hunting uh, demons and there's a bad guy. And it's, it's a lot of gobbledygook. There's a guy who's more or less Dumbledore and <laughs> sure. it's more or less Hogwarts they go to in the middle of New York. It, the movie looks great. Yeah. I mean, it's really well photographed and good special effects and all that. But I couldn't take it seriously. I, I tuned out after a while because it was just so lame. It's the, <laughs> the, the pretty girl who can't find a man and she's torn, be, torn between two lovers. <laughs> and it's just, this is just silly. And then it, when it starts popping up with like, well, I don't want to give anything away for somebody who might want to see this. But there's a, a plot revelation and I'm like, oh, somebody saw Empire Strikes Back. And then a minute <laughs> right. later... And apparently they saw Return of the Jedi, too. <laughs> I'm like, okay, yes, Star Wars is the greatest film ever made. We all know that. But can we stop just repeating that right. in every film that we see? Uh, so it, it got incredibly silly to me with all the stuff with the fighting groups of werewolves and vampires that just felt like, you know, a pinch of Underworld and a pinch of Twilight. <laughs> and I'm sure there's an audience for this. I'm sure there are people who like this a lot. But I just thought it was a silly hunk of garbage. I, I agree completely that it's silly. It, it kept me going for a little while. I thought performances were fine yeah. overall. When you really look at it, it is clearly just the story that is so derivative and so, you know, just trying to recreate some new things. But I thought the actors were fine. They delivered these, these painful lines as well as they could. It looked really good. 
So if, if you're liking the way the trailer looks, if you're liking, you're just needing another fix of, as you say, Underworld, Star Wars, Twilight, it, it's Harry like, Potter. It, it's like they have all these little index cards that they keep rearranging. They, they took all the right, elements of, of Twilight script. and Harry Potter <laughs> and they didn't, okay, okay, maybe this time it'll work. And they make it <laughs> based on a book too and it's got three at least three books in that series. Okay, great. Excellent. Let's try it. Oh, it didn't work. Okay, well, let's rearrange them again. Let's make another one. Uh, it didn't work. Let's rearrange them and make another one. And it's like, how many more times are we going to see this same, They'll get almost going. the exact same thing until it hits or until, I guess it's until it's time to just start remaking the Harry Potter movies, which I think is 10 years or less before you start before remaking Before you get that going, series. I think. Yeah, okay. Well, then uh, um, he can play Dumbledore, so. Yeah, Harry exactly. Can, anyway, moving along. So moving on, we've got more nefarious uh, goings on with that Gargamel. What's his problem? He's got to try to create his own Smurfs, but oh, he's got to kidnap people, and there's just that ingredient that you really need to make the first Smurf, and then you'll probably need that same ingredient again to make a Smurf too. Anyway, uh, yeah. yes, yeah. This is speaking of Oscar categories. Speaking yes, of don't Oscar you, bait, don't you think? <laughs> uh, not a fan of the Smurfs as a kid. I'll agree. The age I was at, that was for girls. Uh, which we, at the time, as a little kid, that was a bad thing. Well, that's for girls. Uh, so we're, we're growing up now, seeing a, a Smurfs movie, I'm like, really? All these films that, that were cartoons I didn't take seriously, made into movies, I just can't take seriously. Right. I didn't really care for the first Smurfs movie. Thought Smurfs 2 was better than the first movie for me, but I didn't like the first movie. So better right. than something I did, right. really didn't like is not saying a whole lot. Uh, for me, the best thing about it was Brendan Gleeson as the father-in-law. Okay. Of um, I don't remember the male lead. <laughs> the male right. lead in this film, Neil Patrick Harris. Oh, Neil Patrick Harris. He's, right, he's a small time that. actor. Nobody's gonna. Yeah, remember who his can name. remember that? No, that nobody else. That guy either. Uh, Brendan Gleeson as Neil Patrick Harris's father-in-law was quite funny, and he gets turned into a duck in the film, and all that <laughs> stuff I thought was actually rather amusing. Right. Uh, otherwise, it's a movie for little kids. Yeah. Really, uh, I could use a little bit less of the Smurfs using the word Smurf to yeah, replace to, dirty words, because right. that just seems not very classy to me in a kid's film. But otherwise, uh, it's a movie for kids. Right. <laughs> so there's not much I can criticize about it. I, I still thought that, um, strangely enough, that in, in the, the second one, that uh, there was enough, a little bit additional there, kind of wink winks, and maybe it's because of the casting mm -hmm. with Neil Patrick Harris and, and some of these other folks, that for the adults, I think it keeps us there. Um, the animation was terrific, mm -hmm. and their integration of the, the clear animation with the live action stuff, I thought was real impressive. There's enough silly little things going on in the background that while I'm not a fan of the Smurfs, never have been, and aren't crazy about the movies, I thought this had enough to keep me going, that uh, I was more pleasantly surprised by Smurfs 2 than I was at least by the original. For me, it was nice, it was, it was if nothing else, a way to spend a tiny bit of time with Jonathan Winters one last time, because okay, he had right. recorded the Popper Smurf voiceover before he died, which was nice. Uh, not that he died, that he re that it was to hear him again right. was nice. <laughs> and uh, this did something that I wish the first one had done, which is you get to spend a bit more time in the Smurf world right. before you come to our world. And the first one, you're there for like 30 seconds and suddenly you're in the modern world and it, it didn't feel like there was that much of a fish out of water thing for them because you didn't see the pond they were swimming in beforehand. And in this, you, you get a bit more of that. Right. That was kind of interesting. Um, but otherwise, uh, I would say this would be one to rent for the kids and then leave the room and go do what you need to do. <laughs> go, let, them, let them sit there and watch it. Yeah, yeah. So in the theaters, I think uh, we're looking at book thief. There's a, there's a lot of Nazi Germany stuff going on kind of here, uh, or at least war stuff. Uh, we're looking at the book thief in theaters and Wolverine on, uh, on video. I, I heartily, heartily agree. Yes. Uh, so next week, it looks like we probably in theaters have, I think there's only like one movie coming out next I think, week. Great, it's gonna be a little slow until we start moving yeah. into the Saving Mr. Banks's and all these kinds of right. things toward the end of the month. Which is, you know, okay, we have a minute. Um, I firmly believe that general audiences, normal people, don't wanna watch movies about movies. They don't wanna read a book about somebody writing a book, they right. don't wanna listen to a song about somebody who's trying to write a song. So this Mr. Banks film, which is about Walt Disney trying to convince the uh, author, authoress, author of Mary Poppins to let him make a movie of Mary Poppins, right. that looks interesting to me, but I don't know if regular people care about that. Right. I think they just wanna watch Mary Poppins. Probably, right. Do they wanna watch people coming up with, I don't know, it just seems, it seems a, Hollywood keeps doing it because Hollywood finds it interesting and, and LA people find movies about movies interesting, right. but I think regular people don't. So I'll be curious to see how well it's got Banks two is. huge stars, and so yeah, that, that'll have a draw to it. But yeah, whether or not um, normal people um, would really care about it, I'm, that, that's a good point. Um, I find it interesting because I love both of them. Yeah. Um, and yeah, obviously the filmmaking process, but that's a good point. Um, and, and relative to that, another uh, 
uh, like big name films coming out. I'm not really sure what's done uh, down the pike for us. Uh, I think some movie called Anchorman Two is probably oh, coming that, out. Oh, that might be there, and that's there's a highfalutin, uh, high concept film. Well, no, it, don't it, you it, think? All I know about what's coming out are really are the trailers that I see at Keene Cinemas before the right. films, and certain films I can't wait until they come out, so I don't need to see the trailers anymore. <laughs> yep. And Anchorman, I've been seeing advertised for what seems like a year now, and I think I think that's a January release or yeah. a Christmas uh, release. I think, I think it's, it's Christmas. Christmas. And then this, pardon me if you worked on this stupid looking I Frankenstein movie yes. about the sexy kung fu Frankenstein, <laughs> which looks ridiculously awful. And I like bad movies. Uh, that's not coming out until January 24th. Right. And I'm just like, oh my just God, we need to see this every three times a week, every week until January 24th. Right. It can't come But without the enough. Harry Potters or anything, there's no real huge, um, you know, holiday, Christmas holiday kind of, kind of film that I think everybody's expecting. And I think... Um, just uh, does although with Anchorman, as much as I love the first one, it does look better the more oh, trailers I, I see. I still haven't seen the first one. I don't like Will Ferrell generally, so I'm I'm going into this one as open as possible. Okay, but I'm saying the trailers don't. Don't great you need to me. think you need to do a lot of research Context. on the first Anchorman and uh, per humps. Yes. Anyway, uh, that's all I got this week. That's all I got this week too. Uh, so I, if shall we? You ready? Okay. okay. Ready? One. One. Two. Three. Until, Until next, next week. week. I'm Mark and I'm Tom and, and we are the, the Cinemaniacs. <laughs> We tried. We'll try again next week.